All right, uh, I want to talk about invertible bloom filters, which I thought was just a super interesting kind of data structure when I uh, was looking for a bunch of things uh, on like how to do sync better. And just I just came across like a paper I liked and I wanted to present about it because I think it's very interesting. Uh, it's not to be confused, by the way, with inverted bloom, bloom filters, which, uh, because Hannah has asked about it, uh, you were saying there was like there's probably also a bloom filter variant that doesn't have false positives but rather false negatives or the other way around whatever uh, and inverted bloom filters are exactly what that does but this is not what I'm talking about or that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about inversible bloom filters uh, so that's just an aside which I thought was maybe interesting to uh, mention all right so uh, the problem I was trying to solve was uh, we would have two peers and I would have like a DAG in both of them, and one of them would add some stuff, and I want to sync that without having to send over the whole DAG again. So I want to have some deduplication there. Uh, and so ideally, I just send over those two new nodes, and then both of them have the same data, and everything's fine. Uh, that is the Underlying idea, of course, is like other edge cases, like what if the other node has some extra stuff and they want to sync and like end up in the same state. I'm just gonna simplify this for now and keep it at that. All right, uh, so the thing is, for us, BitSwap was working pretty good in those cases, or in most cases, BitSwap works pretty nicely, but sometimes you would have these kinds of trees, and Brooke has talked about that, that is our big problem. Sometimes we have these super long chains of stuff and BitSwap just takes a lot of time to do all of those run trips. And so you end up doing, uh, or having like very high latency and you, uh, like your peers end up talking to each other a bunch until they finally have synced all of those trees. But uh, the thing is the DAG structure actually for us doesn't matter that much. We can kind of forget about the DAG structure. It's all about both peers knowing what set of hashes they have or don't have. And so that makes it become a, like, and then you s send over just the difference of the hashes, set of hashes that both peers have, and that becomes a set reconciliation problem. And so naturally I went looking for papers and eventually found this, which is what's the difference efficient set reconciliation without prior context? Um, and like in disguise, it's just inverted bloom filters. And so that's what I'm talking about. And, I like the title of the paper. Um, without prior context means like other kinds of protocols need uh, like some kind of context for both peers to have in advance. Uh, but this paper really just assumes, just like BitSwap, that there's no prior context. Uh, peers are just asking, "Hey, uh, I have this stuff. Um, what is the difference?" And like it's a like two round trip kind of protocol to get all of the uh, differences between those peers and uh, the like the amount of stuff you have to send over is big O of the difference of the sets and not big O of the sets themselves. So it's very little round trips and potentially very little stuff to transfer, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, right, so how would you do set reconciliation? So here I have like two peers, kind of, or two sets of hashes, you could say. Uh, and there's like one set that has two blue hashes which indicate like some additional stuff, some additional hashes. And I can take the set difference and I'll get back that hash. Uh, the problem is those two sets of hashes don't live on the same machine. So to do this kind of difference operation, I would have to synchronize the sets, send potentially lots of hashes over the wire and I don't want to do that. So what I can do instead is I can use an encoding kind of function to encode these sets as invertible bloom filters. And these bloom filters have hand wavy, constant size. Uh, so their size depends on some other parameter that is not the size of the sets here at the top. Um, and what I can do with those invertible bloom filters is I can just subtract them. That's the magic of these kinds of bloom filters. And you get a new bloom filter and that bloom filter is actually the encoding of that different set. And there exists a decoding function that takes the bloom filter and creates the, like, gives you the difference uh, set. 
Of course, there's like some caveats. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. I, I can like go the top route, which means like potentially sending over a bunch of stuff, or I can go the bottom route. The caveat is this decoding function. Uh, it's being a Bloom filter has some success rate and some failure rate. It sometimes fails. You just can't reconstruct the whole set. Um, but like, and that is tunable by the parameter, and that's the size of the Bloom filter. Um, so you, but the interesting thing is, uh, the failure rate depends on the size of the set you want to reconstruct, not of the size of the sets you used in the very beginning here at the top. And so the Bloom filter size depends on the size of the difference of your sets, which is the whole magical thing. Right? Um, yeah. And so like you can tune the size to get like different success, success rates. And you can like, I think the paper just assumes a 99% success rate. And if you fail decoding the uh, inverted Bloom filter, what you do is you just run some other protocol or retry with a different size, uh, stuff like that. Okay, so how does it work? I mean, Brooke, I think, uh, like, touched on that a little bit on the Carsync talk. Um, and it, like, at the end of the day, this may be just something that is interesting for others to know about and less something that we're going to do for sure. Uh, I just want to preface that. But it is nonetheless very interesting and very useful in some cases, I think. So just like in Brooke's slides, we have a Bloom filter or an in inverted Bloom filter which is somewhat like a counting Bloom filter. So uh, you have a bunch of cells, and at the very bottom you see the count here, this, like the last row, um, of elements that were hashed into the cell. The middle row is some kind of uh, small byte thing. Like in my implementation, I just use a 64-bit uh, number. Um, it is essentially, you can think of it as a checksum, and at the very top, this is these XOR cells that Brooke has been talking about. And so when I have um, some hash, let's say this dead beef hash, I uh, find some cells in the Bloom filter that uh, correspond to the hash, and I increase the count, and I, like the top cells are just 32 byte cells, so they're, they're the whole hash. Uh, they're where you're getting from like the element in the decoding function eventually. Um, and then the middle row is just some kind of check something. You just do a different hash function uh, on your hash. I know, I'm going to say hash a lot in this talk, I think. Um, and yeah, you, you store that kind of thing in there. And when you have uh, something else that you're hashing in there, uh, you just increase the counts again. And when you, when you like hit a conflict, what you do is you XOR your hash and you XOR your checksum hash. All right. Um, yeah. So, top row is the is in the paper is called the ID. Uh, middle row in the paper is called the hash, and bottom row is the, called the count. I find that a little bit confusing. So, when you're reading the paper, uh, keep in mind that ID is actually a hash, and hash is a hash of a hash. Yeah. All right. Um, and then there is a decode function. So you can like take a uh, inverted Bloom filter that you encode it, and you can decode it. Uh, the way you do this is you look for cells that have a one or a minus one. We'll uh, maybe touch on that. Um, and you just look at the uh, very top kind of cell, and uh, you know that only one item was added to it, so it was X ordered with a zero string. And so you know that there's just the hash, and you can read it out if it matches the checksum. Um, and when you have this element, you now know like where, what other cells it was encoded into. And there may be like another cell that does not have a count of one yet, but you can now export or subtract uh, your like, uh, I don't know, hash from that cell and you get back a Bloom filter that may uncover more ones and you iteratively do this until you have an an invertible bloom filter that's empty, and you have like a set of hashes you recovered from it. And of course, this breaks down very quickly, uh, this decode function, if there's like a lot of items in the filter. And uh, the magic of the, the filter is that its size doesn't, yeah, uh, its size does not depend on like the amount of items you have in there. So let's say this is one machine and has this kind of uh, invertible bloom filter. 
there's thousands of items in there, you can't recover anything. But if you have another machine, and it has a very, very similar kind of set, it has lots of items in there as well, just a tiny difference in, in between them, once you uh, subtract them, and the subtracting is using XOR, and it's like doing minus in the counts, uh, counts you'll get back a bloom filter that is maybe just a single element, and you can decode that, right? Um, that's basically it. Um, there's some fun stuff you can do with it. Uh, I mean, this is like, uh, for example, in our use cases, we're like, hmm, maybe we can't quite, quite use this because you may have like a uh, phone and you may have a laptop and your phone doesn't actually store the whole DAG or your whole file system or whatever it is. Uh, it may not do that. Um, and so in those cases, right, you don't want to actually sync those DAGs. You kind of only want to sync, I mean, some parts of it. You, there needs to like, what I'm trying to illustrate here is some fun application or some fun uh, thinking around inversible bloom filters and using their algebraic properties to uh, like do some interesting use case. So what I want to have is I have a phone, I work on it, um, like I have some DAG here, but my phone doesn't have the whole DAG. It just has a bunch of things that it fetched and the rest of it is, it doesn't care about. Then there's an update or two concurrent updates on both the phone and the, and the laptop. And the laptop wants to fetch everything from the phone and the phone wants to know what has since happened on the laptop side. I can still use invertible bloom filters for this uh, because there's, they have these nice algebraic properties. And the idea is I have an invertible bloom filter for the whole set on my laptop. And I have an inversible bloom filter for the stuff that the phone did not store. And the stuff that the phone does store is also an invertible bloom filter, and I can just add them together to get the invert invertible bloom filter that represents the whole set that the phone has. And I can take that to like compute the difference between them. And like this, these kinds of algebraic properties, I think there's maybe some more stuff to uncover here, some more kind of interesting use case you could do with it. I don't know. Um, yeah, very, very application space, I think. Um, there are some caveats. So, <laughs> Inversible bloom filters are like the paper and some slides that the author uh, has say it's like only really efficient if you have diffs that are like max in, at maximum like 10 to 15 percent of the total set size. So, uh, for example, if you have a new node coming into to the uh, system and like it has zero hashes and you have a node that has a whole DAG that it wants, of course encoding that set of hashes as an invertible bloom filter that you can decode is going to take a lot of space and that's just not efficient. So like the efficiency is like up until 10 to 15% of a set size, you can use them. Um, you need to, <laughs> that is the problem, you need to choose the size of your bloom filter in advance, um, which sounds like just a bummer and like <laughs> it kind of, uh, uh, breaks the whole pro protocol, but it doesn't actually, I, prom I promise. Uh, there's like a strata estimator that's described in the uh, paper. I just don't have enough space in this talk to uh, talk about that. But yeah, it kind of estimates how big the difference uh, in, in like the set uh, size is. So you can still do the whole thing in two round trips. You just need to prepare a bunch of bloom filters with different sizes, which is like, I don't know, kind of a thing with bloom filters in general. <laughs> All right, uh, and that is also a problem, right? Bloom filters, constructing them takes time. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much all I have. Oh yeah, right, there's a chance you can't decode the bloom filter. Yeah, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, there's a paper link, uh, and I wrote an implementation in Rust as a toy, um, so I'll, I'll post those slides as a PDF, and yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Please. When you saying there's a chance it can't decode, are you saying at a certain point it goes, uh-oh, I don't understand, or does it start sending incorrect information? It, it goes, uh-oh, I don't understand. So specifically, you have like the count at the bottom, and you, you look for so-called pure salts, which is count one or count minus one. Uh, and it may just happen that uh, all of the cells in there um, have count two or above. 
and you don't know what to subtract, subtract anymore to like get another pure solid. And so it kind of just throws its hands in the air and says, I can't decode, sorry. Sure? Uh, I'm curious, and so you, you, sh yeah, I, you shared this paper earlier in, in the discussions. How do, how do you go about finding, I've heard a couple of people be like, I want to go look at the research. Like, how do you go about finding research on interesting topics in, this, in our area? <laughs> I mean, it sounds super stupid. I think I uh, I just Googled different kind of keywords, found a stack of overflow answer from the author. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I Googled syncing DAGs and someone asked this in stack overflow and the author of this paper actually answered. And so I kind of, that was my intro to it. And then I look for other papers, stuff like that, references. I will say that generally the vision team has a large repository of papers in our Discord and in our discourse forum. Um, and so that might actually even warrant, specifically for IPFS, maybe we literally set up a papers category in the IPFS discourse that we can tag um, and collectively find useful things together. Uh, e Research is actually a really another great example that, that does this. E3 Research, the Ethereum oh, yeah. uh, Research yeah. Discourse Forum, also like has a similar pattern. I always find the language described it, used to describe it as a paper is not the language that I ever would have used. Which is, you can't find it in the search. Which is why tags and other yeah. things like that that would work for us might work better, right? Like you, you were like, I Googled tags and I was like, there's no way. Nobody <laughs> <laughs> used the word tag in paper. <laughs> it is true, it's true, yeah. Nobody does. Yeah, like they'll say like efficient set reconciliation. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? It's a math problem. <laughs> they talk about graphs and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah they do. If you dig into the, if you start reading, well, they're graph theory. Yeah. yeah. If you're clicking the CRDTs, there's lots of CRDT papers. There's lots of CRDT papers that describe things that like don't look like CRDTs. Um, yeah, those conditions. Also, maybe a shameless plug. We do have a, fi a fission Discord, and we have a papers channel in there, and we. Continuously post papers there, so. Why I want to get it? Does any other behavior that we all do this, right? For the person that posts the paper, it often pulls the kind of like really part of the paper and abstracts it into the top thread, and that for me has been really a really useful pattern. So like, don't just give me a link. Give me a link and the sentence that you found connected our universe to that paper. To help get over the hump of efficient set reconciliation. So, are these like, uh, my understanding is like, so these buckets are actually the size of the Yeah, yeah. so, these are big. yes. Like, in like a normal Bloom filter, this is one bit. Yeah. In our Bloom filter, this is 32 bytes plus uh, eight bytes plus eight bytes. So you have like 48 bytes per bucket. Right, and compression over that, is like, it's just a lot. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it pays off because of like the whole thing with, uh, if your set difference compared to your set is like small, then it pays off uh, like over constructing bloom filters that encode the set instead right. of the set difference. That's why I'm like, yeah, there's, uh, ca there's caveats. It's really probabilistic, <laughs> right? Like it feels like we have to have a, 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 a I just want to understand the rate of things that go for it. It's going to be highly dependent on the graph difference like, that you're actually seeing while, if I understand this correctly. This would be like the same way that you, for the ant inside of what happens, actually measure for the proper you know, size of the buckets arrive at 16 by actually doing real research. I just feel like, I, I get the sense that I would love to try and run that to ground and understand, like, hey, how often do we end up with these? Absolutely. Subtractions, given a series of different deck permutations. Yeah, absolutely. I think in terms of like use case, especially, I can think of this being very useful for um, more like IPFS operators that have very, very big pin sets, mm. but have like over time, they change very little, but then they have like, let's say some cluster or something, and they want to like 
talk in this cluster, figure out what, what they need to send each other. Uh, but that said, maybe it's not too important to have like very, uh, very low round trips in, in like in between cluster nodes. I don't know. So maybe like, yeah, there's a bunch to understand about them in the like, like so kind of you are case cases. Below. So like in the manifest world, you are sending one-to-one -one CID to, and so this is an improvement on that. Yes. With the exact with the emissions and loss but like, yeah. it's really interesting. This, there's things like it's, it's like, it's not quite like a no contact sort of thing. There's something behind the scene. It's like there is an object we're trying to send you. Right. Right? Yeah. Right? Which is like there, no, like me and you both have a mutable pointer to a data. Like you both have a Git repo. Yeah. And we want to sync the state of that repo. Which is, a, which is like a real use case. Yeah. We'll have for the syncing. Which is a different form of the problem mm -hmm. than like I want to download I want to download you know the whole yeah, with, yeah. I want to download Wikipedia yeah. given that I have some of Wikipedia already. Yeah. Like it's just, a, which is like because now your your tech setup is dramatically exceeds the Yeah, but yeah. also you don't have if we both have a Git repo, there is some common information there that we okay. know. So it's not totally. So, so I'm sorry, maybe that's a different, a different version of that. It's not, because so, the example you can be a misleading, because both of the people who can have a name, right? Right? And that makes it back to a table point. So that was the time to say. The, maybe a better example is like, I want to download, uh, I have a Beans paper movies, and I have a fault. And then I go and I download, I want to download Brendan's paper movies. It's a different mutable pointer having nothing to do with mine. Right. It just turns out that like you both happen to like like eighty percent of the same stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so like that doesn't quite fit this model, right? Because we have no, there isn't. It's not no context. There is context. There's a mutable pointer behind the scenes that's telling you what the thing is, which is useful. It's just a slightly different problem. I, I, would, I would turn that just off the cuff to ambient duplication. Just the idea that you take. Sets of stuff that may overlap you get, and versus this is doing much more with like high probability of duplication via the fact that it's virtual. It's, it's other versions of yourself yeah. as the first case, or the other case where you've got if we do a larger n, um, you know, uh, James and Philip have shared have a shared folder, yeah. and they each have n devices who are on and offline. And you know that there's, it's going to sync somewhere in there because they're operating over the same set. Oh my god, I use them now. <laughs> there, there, like, the more you think about this is like a bunch of individual actors who have like varying issues in state, the, the less useful this is. But I, I would argue that this is like not the most common case. Like, like when you were talking about the mobile device in the cloud and like maybe you don't want the whole database in the mobile device. Absolutely. But if you're thinking of the whole database with just a bunch of hash blocks, then any query is also just a bunch of hash blocks. And yes. Of hash blocks. And what you do want on your phone is like the same big ass query all the time. Um, so like anybody who has like more stake than they want on the device over here, and then a subset of here, you can take that query and sync it all the time. And the set's always going to be less than ten percent. Like it's all very useful. Absolutely. Like this is, it's it's the question of like where, what set do you choose? And different things, like it may be Wikipedia, it may be everything under this hash, or it may just be, in the general case, an IPLD selector, or some kind of selector, some kind of query. So but maybe this is a really, really good point, right? Like, so you've literally described in words places where this technique would be useful, mm -hmm. which could be written up in regular human language, <laughs> right? And, and be like, if this is the use case that you're like, I have a mobile thing, I'm doing a thing, right? And Or even do the anti, where it's like, for an example, if you're doing Wikipedia, this is not a good use case. Um, so even even collecting some of those things as techniques to use cases could be useful. Yeah, and maybe like one more thing. I wanted to address something you, you said with the prior, prior context. It's true. You need some kind of prior context. You need to know what set are both peers like talking about, right? Uh, but what you don't need to know is uh, you don't like maybe in contrast to other kind of protocols. For example, if you're regularly communicating between your phone and your laptop, uh, you may just remember what your laptop has or had the last time. 
And so you can... It's not easy on kids to be like, I want five, or you like 10, give me the numbers. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's, that is the context that this is talking about. All right? Hey. Thank you.